Good morning, everyone. Hi, my name is Krista Broderson. I'm an environmental consultant with a company called Blackstone Environmental. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about due diligence. Oh. That's way of playing. <laughs> well, I'll get one second. I'm not an electronic person, so this one's. Okay. Try it this way. All right. So, environmental due diligence is a process that evaluates environmental conditions and risks associated with the property prior to taking ownership. And why is this so important? Well, it is extremely important because due diligence provides you protection from liability for contamination. This liability stems from CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act. Pressing that fast three times. <laughs> it's also known as Superfund. So this act was passed in 1980 in response to some environmental disasters. One of the most famous is Love Canal in New York. And among a wide variety of things that Circular does, it establishes liability for contamination. So basically what it says is if you own property, you are could be held responsible for contamination, whether or not you caused that contamination. So for example, let's say you buy a take ownership of a piece of property today. Tomorrow you find out there was a toxic waste dump. According to the EPA, you are responsible to clean that up, even though you had nothing to do with it. So the law, love it, but it also made it difficult for people to buy properties. They wanted to open businesses and didn't want to be liable for something that someone else caused a day ago or 10 years ago. So the response to that was an amendment called SARA. And what that did was provide for the innocent landowner defense. So what that says is if you conduct your all appropriate inquiry or due diligence prior to taking ownership, you would not be held responsible. Now, how do we do our due diligence or all appropriate inquiry? It's called a phase one environmental site assessment or phase one or phase one ESA. And basically what a phase one is, it's a research document. We are researching the property for any potential contamination from the property or even in the vicinity of the property. And they have several components. Um, a major one is a records review. We review records for the site and surrounding properties for a mile outside of the property. Uh, we do a historic research back to 1940 at least or development. Now, if you're in an older city like Dubuque or Clinton, um, we'll have records that go back to 18. 80s, 1870s. So we will start our research then. Uh, we conduct a site visit to look at the site. We do interviews with the current and former owners, and then there's the report. And like I said, the phase one, you don't have to worry about just your property. You have to worry about the property surrounding you. And the reason you have to worry about this is <coughs> shows in this slide. So here's contaminated soil. Let's say this was gasoline station next to the property you want to buy. They had a spill. The spill leaks into the ground, into the soil, into the groundwater, and flows toward your property. This is depicting soil vapor. So the contaminants vaporize and go into your house and can make people sick. Now, you may have a drinking water well. If you had a drinking water well, your contamination is going into the well and people in this property can have access to that contamination. So this is why we are all concerned 
about neighboring properties as well. So when are phase ones required? I get this question a lot. And the answer is any time you are taking ownership to a property. CERCLA says, if you do your due diligence prior to taking ownership, you may not be liable for contamination. So anytime you are taking ownership, I like to think of it instead of when is it needed, assume you need a phase one if you're taking title. And then there are some exceptions I'm going to talk about. If you fit into those exemptions, then you may not need one. But I would assume you always need a phase one. Without a phase one, you have no defense whatsoever. And I like to think of phase ones as an insurance policy. You wouldn't buy a piece of property and not have insurance. A phase one, typically they cost about $2,500 compared to hundreds of thousands of dollars for cleanup. It's just like your homeowner's insurance. You pay $300 and you get $300,000 in insurance. Okay, there are um, several exemptions in CERCLA for state and local government. So if you've detained a property during uh, law enforcement activity, bankruptcy, delinquency, or abandonment, then you are exempt from the CERCLA regulation. However, you have to make sure you are following rules for these. If for some reason, uh, properties in tank tax delinquency, and you decided, well, we're just going to do a, a short sale to get this over with. You will no longer are exempt. So if you have questions, like I said, I would assume you have to do a phase one. If you think you fall into this category, but you're not sure, I would call Mel here. <laughs> he is the expert. He's wonderful to work with and very helpful. So if you have any questions, call your consultant. You can call me if you don't have a consultant. You can call Dawn or Mel, but make sure you know before you sign on the dotted line. So I'm trying to convince you to do a phase one at all times. If you think one is not needed, I'm going to try and convince you a little bit more. And warning, I'm hoping that these next slides may change your mind. So I have a couple stories from <laughs> previous projects that are cautionary tales. So the first one, excuse me, was, is a city in Illinois. The part of the town was just getting really run down. A lot of the businesses were moving out. And the city, and it was also a food desert. So the city is trying to attract retailers and they found one that was interested, but they wanted vacant lots. So the city started buying properties. They found a 23 acre plot of land that had um, an old strip mall and some other commercial buildings that were half falling down, half empty. So they spent five years and $15 million acquiring all these properties relocating businesses and tearing down the property so that it was shovel ready for the retailer. Out of the $15 million, they did not do a phase one. They decided not to do a $2,500 phase one. <clears throat> the retailer who was gonna move in prior to signing on the dotted line decided they were gonna do a phase one. And what they found was a dry cleaner. And for those of you who don't know, Dry cleaners are pretty nasty. Um, I've never investigated a dry cleaner that wasn't dirty. They're always dirty. And so they found the dry cleaner. So what we do after the phase one is a phase two. We collected soil and groundwater samples and found very high concentrations of dry cleaning fluid that modeled over a quarter of a mile away. Actually, they stopped because it's stopped in the river. So the retailer backed out of the deal. 
they didn't say specifically it was because of this. They didn't actually share this with the city. But it was a week after this that they backed out. So I'm assuming this is, and it's a pretty big issue. Now, what they could have done, the, the city could have spent $2,500 and saved $15 million by doing this. <laughs> Excuse me. And just because there's contamination does not mean that the property could not be developed. So don't let that scare you away either. What they could have done if they did the phase one, the city could have said to the property owner, you have to clean this up before we buy it. And they would have been responsible for the cleanup. The city could have also taken responsibility for the cleanup, bought the property maybe at a reduced price, and then spent maybe $500,000 instead of 15 million. Now, the property has sat there vacant for the last eight years. And if you, you can imagine that the citizens are not very happy, they still have a food desert, there's still not businesses there. And then the city spent $15 million on a vacant lot that nobody's using. So, <laughs> okay, let's see. I apologize. It looks like we're going to need to go through this one. I'm very sorry about this. No worries. Okay. It just reinforces your message. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh. All right. Um, another thing I I hear a lot. I don't need a phase one. It was just farmland. I don't need a phase one. It's a coffee shop. I've lived here my whole life, and that's been a grocery store my whole life. So my second caution <laughs> detail is about a farm in Bettendorf. Um, it was used as a farm from at least 1930. That's the earliest record. So probably before that, uh, through 2010. All right, let's see if I can find it. Yay. Okay. Um, so there was a potential developer that wanted to develop this area in red. Developer actually did do a phase one. And what they found was this area in yellow was used as a landfill from the 50s to the 60s. It was an unpermitted, unlined landfill. And if any of you are familiar with Bettendorf, there's a lot of manufacturing facilities down by the river. Well, anybody and everybody was allowed to come and dump and this landfill. The other thing that he did is what they call, they're calling it an oil pit. He dug a big hole and anybody with waste oil or waste solvents, anything could come and dump in this pit for at least 10, 20 years. Covered it up with soil and then grew crops on it until this developer comes along and wants to put houses on it. The developer did the right thing. And if you can see here, it's a nice residential neighborhood. Well, the, because of the severity of the contamination on that property, the EPA is now involved and the farmer doesn't have the money to clean it up. So the EPA has been um, assessing that site since 2017. They found PCBs, VOCs, metals, you know, all the good things that you don't want anywhere near you, they found on that property. The adjacent property is beautiful residential development. This is actually a photo of one of the houses I took off a realtor's website last week. This house, I think, is right here. It's for sale for a million and change. 
I've looked at it. Newspaper articles, those people know nothing about that contamination. So now we have a million dollar house 300 feet away from an oil pit. I don't know about you, but I would not want to. Well, I could get it for the right price, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> so just do that. Now for residents, um, if you're a single family residence, you do not have to do a phase one if you're buying the house to live in. The developer that bought this entire area was required to do a phase one. And they would have found this and nobody would have put a house anywhere near that if they had actually done their phase one. <clears throat> so phase ones provide circle of liability. They need to be conducted prior to taking ownership of the property. And let me say too, I have been a consultant for almost 25 years. I have written hundreds and hundreds of phase ones. I, for a portion of my career, I worked at a national bank as a risk assessor. And for three years, all I did was review phase ones and phase twos from all over the country. I can tell you, I am still shocked by the things that we find and the things people do. So if you have a board member that says, you know, oh, that was my cousin's property. It's always been this, we don't need a phase one. You need a phase one. You always need a phase one. That should be your default. You don't want something like that farm house. Especially if you're a city, you have bigger pockets and people expect more from you. If something like that happens, you're getting sued. Um, the other thing with the phase one, they are they're required to qualify for brownfields assistance. Well, what is a brownfield site? So this is the technical definition. It's a property where the expansion, redevelopment, or reuse may be complicated by the presence or potential presence of a hazardous substance or contaminant. So what does that really mean in normal people speak? What it means is, take a look at this property. It looks like it was a former service station and maybe gas station. Would you want to put your brand new coffee shop right next to this? Is that going to attract developers? Would you want to convert that into a restaurant? Probably not. Um, do you think you could actually get a loan for that property? Probably not. And it may not be contaminated, but when you look at it, people get the impression that it's contaminated. So if you're concerned about a release, any of these things I just talked about, you have a brownfield property. Anything that's hindering your ability to redevelop the site. So just appearance alone can cause it to be a brownfield property. Now, uh, the government, the EPA gives out brownfields grants. Um, Mel has the grant for the state. Dawn has one for her five counties that she works with. Cities and nonprofits can apply for those. And what they do is they pay for phase ones, um, inventories of property, cleanup, um, all different kinds of things. And this is an example of a property that nobody wants to really go next to because it doesn't look nice. And it could be contaminated and it's turned into this really nice apartment complex. So Dawn and Mel can help you if you don't have the money for a phase one, depending on how much money they have left in grants and not promising their money to you. But they may be able to help you if you're not sure, if you fall into any of the exemptions, they can help you with that. Um, they're really great people to work with. They're so very helpful. So again, I would encourage you, if you have questions at all, don't proceed without a phase one. Call a consultant, call Mel or Dawn, or Mel will give you somebody else to call. So, you have any questions? Thank you so much for your time, by the way. Was it Chris's main message? <laughs> How long do phase ones take? Uh, they take about 15 business days, 15 to 20. So, and it just depends if you have, if you're doing a 10 block area in a downtown that's been developed since the 1800s. It may take a month because that's a lot of records, but they usually start about $2,500.
I have done a twenty-five thousand dollar phase one, but that was ten miles of freeway in the middle of Los Angeles, and we still went under budget. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and Krista, something to reinforce: uh, this is a great message, great presentation. Um, this is referencing federal liability for environmental contamination, which you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the times properties will never get to the point that the federal EPA out of Kansas City, Missouri, that covers this region, or certainly Washington, D.C., is going to be involved. Um, and the DNR under state authority, we don't kind of fully recognize the phase one process. We may say, yeah, we know you didn't own it back when mobile oil contaminated it. Not to pick on Molo, uh, we'll pick on Molo Group. But um, the idea being, it is a good insurance policy. If a city is going to be buying large tracts of land, especially, certainly if there's been a commercial or industrial development on it, don't just stumble into it. Um, but the biggest message, and I think tying all this together, a lot of what we're going to talk about today are grants and financial assistance with EPA being kind of the predicate or the underlying funding source. And they do follow that federal CERCLA law for not only liability protection, but eligibility like Krista referenced for money. So I have a lot of cities that call me and say, yeah, we just bought the old uh, um, rainbow oil bulk plant on the north side of town. Well, good job. <laughs> um, if you didn't do a phase one, I can't help you clean it up with any grant, sorry. And if there's vapor intrusion issues, better not be building the houses there. Good luck. You now own kind of a pariah of a property. So yeah, always pause and always stop. You know, talk to Don, talk to me, hire Krista if you want. <laughs> you can call me the first phone call. Yeah. <laughs> but again, yeah, yeah. you know, it's not just your property. Right. But you may be exactly. five blocks away from this yep. rural oil or that dry cleaner that I've been on. You're still going to be affected. There's actually this is true. Yep. Uh, there's actually three schools in the path of that flume. That you know, no one that's else. scary. Yeah, it's scary. And most of the time, we don't end up with things like that farm mm -hmm. where the EPA is in play. Right. But if you do, you are in such a world of hurt if you haven't done the phase one. That yep. it's it just it's very silly not to spend twenty five hundred dollars to get an insurance mm -hmm. policy. So. Okay, thank you very Wait, much. What city in Illinois was that first story from? Um, I can't. You can't say. You. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you are. Probably Google that one. Yeah. 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 Don't. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Hey everybody. Part two of Brownville. <laughs> Hi, my name is Don Danielson, and I work here at UCIA. <laughs> Thank you, Krista, for kicking off the Brownville um, series here that we have going. You know, tens of these closeness out in this dialogue in regards to brownfields. And just in case you weren't aware, you have a little bit of a celebrity on Zoom. We have EPA actually on with us. Yes. Jennifer Morris uh, with uh, EPA is on the phone with us. So uh, she's a great resource too. So it, it, at the end, at, after I get done speaking or even you know after mail, if you have any questions for any of us, uh, including Jennifer, um, you know, feel free to ask um, any questions you might have. <clears throat> so the first slide I have that I've thrown up here is Chris gave a nice definition of brownfields. These are brownfields in our region. 
Any of those look familiar? Any anything in this in these pictures look like something you might have in your neighborhood? So just to kind of throw out just some visuals for you of um, some sites that have been identified in our region as brownfields and where we've actually used some of our programs on. So. Um, next slide here, I basically, ECIA has two programs that we administer here currently. And we receive our funding through the United States Environmental Protection, Protection Agency through a competitive grant program. Hey, Don. Yes. yes. Sorry to interrupt, but the Blackstone environmental ones are still up. We can't see on power oh. on Zoom your guys's. Eric, sorry. Oh, hold on a second here. Making sure people are awake out there. <laughs> So as she's doing that, I will say, um, we have we see it now. Still in yeah. Okay. I'm gonna I'm back up so those that are online can also see some of the pictures I was showing of ones that we have in our region. Take a quick moment to look at those and see if you recognize any of them, any of those sites. <clears throat> All right. So as I indicated, ECIA has two grant programs currently that are funded through the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Um, we have what's called an assessment grant fund. And I think Krista alluded that, you know, we might be able to help with um, some of your projects. That is actually pretty much all committed right now. So we're looking at applying for another grant, uh, which we, we would not receive until next fall. So if you, as we're going through this, and you think of any sites that you think that your community could potentially use funding on, let me know, and we'll basically put you on our list and start working on creating our list for the next grant, um, hopefully that we receive. Um, and if we, by chance, don't receive a grant next fall, we have no kids <laughs> in the room. Who has actually got um, funding as well? So we, whether it's whether it's um, ECIA or Mel, or even a third option would be EPA directly through their um, target brownfields assessment program. We can help you with that as well um, to get additional funding for assessments. So as Kristen mentioned, she spoke mainly about a phase one. Out of the assessment program, we can do phase ones. Um, Assessments we can do. I click to the next screen so you can see actually my list of everything that we can do. We can do phase ones, phase two, which is a phase one is basically the history of the property, but the phase two actually goes in and takes samples. Like, okay, you said that you might have this hazard on this property. Okay, let's go test the ground and find out if it is truly contaminated or not. So um, we could do those. We can do uh, provide funding for asbestos inspection, uh, lead-based paint inspections, cleanup if we actually find, if a contaminant is found by our consultant, our environmental consultant, we can help with the uh, creating a cleanup plan. We can do what help create a analysis of brownfield cleanup alternatives. So if you wanted to come up with okay, which would be like the best solution to clean up the site. That's what that plan would help with. We can um, pay for site reuse plan. We actually have a planner on staff, Chris, who's actually here today sitting in the room. And he actually is on our planning team here at ECIA. So he helps us create site reuse plans and he works with our consultants as well. Um, so it's collaboration, create those plans. Um, besides site reuse plans, there's other types of plans that we can do, plan activities. There's like 12 different types. Uh, another one of them is a market feasibility study. So those are all the various services that the assessment grant can fund for communities. Uh, if a community has a property that they consider um, in need of brownfield assistance. 
So all you'd have to do is fill out an application with us. Uh, app applicants that are um, eligible would be the city or even um, a nonprofit, and you don't have to own the property. So it could be a case where the property is sitting there, you have nobody interested in it because potentially people think that it has asbestos in it and they think it's got a huge price to clean up that building of that asbestos. Okay, well then you can contact Mel, yay, or me, and we can help you to determine if we need a phase one and an asbestos inspection on it. Maybe we just need an asbestos inspection. Maybe we do both, it depends on the scenario. Um, go in and find out, is there really truly a contamination on this property of asbestos? And that kind of takes away that mystery and hopefully it can help move the needle so that the city can then look at, okay, well then do you look at cleanup of the site? or try and find out how much it would cost to clean up the site and then try and either find funding for that or even maybe you find, oh, it has a clean build of health. It doesn't have asbestos over the contaminant levels. It doesn't require abatement. Therefore, a developer comes in and says, yeah, now I'm interested in the property. So it just kind of helps move the needle on those sites that are sitting there vacant that, you're, that are in your community, whether they're city owned or not. Um, the grant funds for the assessment um, grant that we have would 100% cover those services that I just mentioned. The next program that we have, whoops, I, actually, I'm going to back up. I'm actually going to give you a quick example of where we've actually used funds from the assessment grant. This is a project in the city of Hopkinton that we're working on currently under our current assessment grant. We did a, we had our consultant, which was uh, Tara Khan go in and do a phase one. They did an asbestos inspection and then they also prepared a asbestos cleanup plan for the site. So in total, our grant funded $12,000 um, for covering those expenses for those services, um, that assess assessment activity that was done. The city themselves then hired um, their uh, a consultant who did subsurface testing and um, then the city actually acquired the site. They purchased it from the old, prior owner for $1,000. Um, um, so they did a phase one and all this work up front. Uh, well, phase one up front and then did the other items listed here. And then they're part of Keep Iowa Beautiful. So I'm not sure if everybody's part of that or not in this room, but they're part of that group and with that, program, they receive one free grant writing a year from ECIA. So ECIA helped them write a grant, which would normally cost about $2,000 um, if you put a monetary value there for the grant writing service. So they helped them write a grant for the Iowa Derelict um, Building Grant Program, and Hopkinton was successful in receiving that uh, award. So in the end, the city will be abating and deconstruction the property, and it will have um, cost the city funds of $5,632. And then the grant from the Dairy Building Grant uh, was $22,225. So the total project, um, the end use of this property is actually going to be a future regional medical center. So, and then it's about $800,000 investment. So the total project is like a $861,000. Property project. So, just kind of give you an idea. Uh, the building has not come down, but it has been abated, correct? Sarah from the city is here today. So, um, so it's kind of in the work of this project. And I just, is it anticipated to be down by spring? Hopefully by the end of this year. I think before end year. Yep. And then they'll be starting to build for the yep. medical center. So, the medical center is in the town of Hopkinton, and this actually saved. Um, the medical center from leaving and going to different locations. I kept the regional medical center in town. By the way, if you're interested in that derelict building grant, now is the time to actually be working on it. It is a very competitive grant. It's a great program. Um, it can cover now is it up to fifty thousand fifty thousand in in um, deconstruction costs for a project. Um, why I say now is the time to do start it is it's due in February, 
but you do have to get a, a three big quotes for it and kind of have to start a lot of preliminary work um, and have it all laid out, um, like I said, for the grant. The more details that go into it, the better. So um, the other grant program that ECIA administers is the revolving loan fund. And currently we have two projects uh, underway on, on this program. Um, this program contains two things. It has loans and it has grants that can actually, once you've identified that there's a contamination on site, it helps you to actually clean up the site with the funds. So a city, a nonprofit, or even a for-profit is eligible to utilize the loan program. The grant funds, only a city and a nonprofit would be eligible to apply for those. And it does require match funds um, from whoever the applicant is for these programs. And as I mentioned, we have two programs or two projects going on with this grant right now, this program. Um, one of them is in the city of Stanwood. And what's nice about this is we started this project, I think it was actually about a year ago now, we started working with the city of Stanwood and we did assessment activities with them, including a phase one asbestos infection, asbestos cleanup plan, and um, we also did a site reuse plan for them. Uh, the total for the assessment activity is about $52,000 that uh, were, were covered basically by the grant. Uh, in the asbestos inspection, it identified asbestos. However, the building has deteriorated so much that the back last fall, they were looking at doing the derelict building grant program, but the building actually started to collapse from the roof from third floor down. So um, they were no longer eligible to do the their building grant program because with that program, you do have to divert from the landfill. And we just couldn't figure a way to get to the 30% diversion that you needed for the, that grant program. So we decided um, to see if the city be interested in uh, applying for the ECIA RLF program, and they did, and they received a, a grant of up to 100000 and then a loan of 50000 to cover whatever costs there might be to um, clean up the site. Uh, because you can't safely abate the asbestos, it has to be a rapid demolition. So um, they went out for bids on the site, and the total for the demolition, rapid demolition, is going to be about $158,800. And here's the breakdown for the project they're getting $100,000 from the RLF as a grant. They're going to get from Mel Penz's DNR Brownfield program, $24,999. And then the city has matched funds into the $33,801, um, which I think they might have somebody within the city, a uh, nonprofit or some organization that's going to even help them with that. So you can see how it's really good to kind of, when you got these buildings, these facilities, kind of stack the programs and reduce down their costs so you can basically get rid of <laughs> these, these properties, um, these buildings, and then have a nice fresh site for ready for reuse. The plan with this particular site is these two buildings actually sit right alongside the municipal <laughs> service building in the city of Stanwood. Um, so the city is planning or thinking that they might at demolition, either expand their services or utilize it for something else for the city. So, I didn't really want to throw too much at you in regards to brownfields, um, but I just want to let you know that uh, you know I'm here if you have any questions as far as what my grant programs can offer. And um, Mel also is here um, if you have questions. We like to take team together. So if you have a project 
I will most likely contact Mal and see how we can partner on that project together. It, you know, he'll do something and I'll do something. Maybe I'll do everything on this project, but the next one we'll do together. So we kind of just kind of work back and forth and we just kind of brainstorm to see, you know, what makes sense for each project um, when we're working. So I, I would like to thank um, Mel. Mel's a great partner. Like I mentioned, I have Jennifer, Jennifer Morris is on the phone or well, actually on Zoom um, and she's a great resource. I, I briefly mentioned that EPA has a program called Target Brownfield Assessment. So that's another program that can be utilized to help with not only um, phase ones and asbestos, but they can help do the phase two, which are more costly um, testing of a site. Um, City of Maquoka is actually utilizing that program currently uh, to, to do some testing that people are saying that they have. So um, I'd like to thank besides um, USPA and Mel, the IODNR, our coalition members for our coalition grant. We have the uh, county of Clinton County and Jackson County are our coalition members. And then with our new grant application, Limestone Bluffs Resource Group going to be joining our application um, that, we're be, that we're applying for right now. And another resource that everybody has available to them in case they haven't heard of, is KSU TAB. Jennifer Clancy is our representative from there, and I can connect you with her, but she offers technical assistance in regards to brownfield sites. So if there's anything, again, that you maybe want to connect with um, her on, I can help you as well um, make that connection. And then some of our regional partners, uh, we also, with this new grant, we're looking at expanding from our five counties that we have currently of Cedar, Clinton, Dubuque, Delaware, and Jackson, we're adding Jones County. And with that, um, we're partnering with um, ECI, e, sorry, ECI COD. Um, and some of our other partners are Jackson County Economic Alliance at Jones County Economic Development, and then the Iowa Waste Exchange. So, does anybody have any questions for me? You did so well and covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't have any questions, uh, uh, we, we say Mel is going to tie us, tie everything all together for us. Um, and we saved him for last year. So if you have any questions at the end, please let me know. Let's put this bill up here. Okay, where can we just take that out? Since no, actually, we're going to put it in. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. All right, <clears throat> so while Marl is getting this put up, uh, my name is Mel Pence. I'm with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. I've spent my entire 30-year career working on environmental issues related to redevelopment. Um, my first five years was private work, last 25 years at DNR, and I've been our brownfield coordinator for the last 18 years. So I'm just kind of getting used to what I'm doing. Um, but I really enjoy working with all 942 Iowa cities around the state, but my favorite area to come and work with is the cities within the ECIA. Yeah. I'm super biased. Uh, I was born and raised down by Des Moines, but my mom and dad are Farley natives, and um, my entire family heritage on both sides of the clan are from Dubuque and Delaware counties. So, if somebody is a Pins, a Hafer, a Schmidt, a Wolf, a Breitbach, or a Latner in Dubuque County, I'm related to them. <laughs> uh, if you're from Delaware County and know anybody, uh, uh, Johannes, uh, McDole, Beavers, Bish, I'm related to them. So I always feel like I could actually move up to Dyersville and be accepted as a native. <laughs> so, because there's a little story behind all that. <laughs> Who's from Dyersville? Anybody here? Yeah. <laughs> but Jerry McGrain is still not from Dyersville. You guys know him? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, since he's populated half your town. Yeah. <laughs> he's, my, he's my wife's brother. <laughs> They're all from New Hampton. They're not from Dyersville, are they? Yeah, no, of course. No, as good of a Catholic as they are. So I'll kind of stop with all the personal references. We'll get it back to what we're here to talk about. But what I want to kind of do is pull this together. This just great background, introduction, details but you're gonna walk out of here and feel like your head explodes on this brownfield stuff. 
you do not have to be the expert on this. All I want you to do is kind of like Krista said, stop, don't acquire properties without phase ones. Just stop and consult. Call Don at ECIA, call me before you start acquiring properties. Now, as cities, you do acquire properties all the time. I understand that. Sometimes you don't do phase ones. I do understand that. But depending on what you're doing and why, look before you leave. If you're going to buy something along the you know, old Illinois central alignment, you know, yeah, let's stop and think about that. Um, we really need to be creative and strategic about protecting your city's interests from environmental liability, a bunch of headaches, then your mayor council doesn't get reelected, or maybe your city administrator is going to be out of a job. Gee, why didn't you do your phase one? You know, now you're getting in trouble with EPA. But more importantly, we want to help you leverage a lot of our funding programs and a lot of our assistance programs. EPA is kind of our kind of like parent or the predicate. A lot of that funding comes from them, but that trickles down. We have some funding at DNR through our brownfield program I'm going to talk about, and obviously Don talked about for cooperative agreements with East, uh, that they have with EPA. Those are all competitive. So ECIA really has to sing for their supper to get those. But they've done a great job for many years, and Don's done an excellent job. Uh, she was a DBNT finance officer, right? Uh, American Trust. Oh, American yeah. Trust. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I have my, yeah. my grandparents, but be that as it may, um, you know, it's a big world of all this brownfield stuff. So just consulting with us can go a long way. So what I want to do here today is give you a little more background on how we can help at DNR with our funding. So first and foremost, <clears throat> I'm going to really drill down on things. I want you to call me and talk to me about what you'd like to do. I call it consultation. Um, because first of all, I am here, we're going to be real direct. I'm here to help facilitate the redevelopment of sites, underlined, italics, bold, you can see that there, uh, to reduce those environmental uncertainties that are hindering your community's redevelopment. Well, that's the definition of a brown field. Um, you're hesitant to touch it, mess with it, like Krista's picture of the old gas station. Yeah, who's going to put a coffee shop in there? Those concerns are hindering your city's interest in acquiring that. So I want to help you answer those questions. I can help a local government. That's who you are. I can help a community-based nonprofit, a housing authority, um, your economic development authority. Um, if it's an economic development group, even if it's like a for-profit, I'm not sure, you know, Dyersville Development, whatever they call it, Jackie. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if she's for-profit or non-profit, but some economic development corporations are for-profit, as long as they're community-based. The board's elected from cities and, um, you know, county supervisors, et cetera. So those are the three groups I can help. Um, I am not going to help a private land developer. I am not going to help uh, Simon Enterprises and partly acquire property to expand their trucking or grain elevators. No. Um, I don't have enough money to help every business and landowner in the state, but strategic projects that you want to do, like Sarah and Hopkinton, although I really didn't put a dime into your project, boy, did we talk to get you eligible for everything, <laughs> right? And, and you can see that now, you know, 10 grand here, 30 grand there, uh, a little investment by them too on some of this, but they're going to get an $800,000 project on what was a place where some guy would just park an old car in a, in a bay in an old gas station. So talk to us about your project, but these are the three entities I can help. I can help those entities figure out, do we have any environmental problems at the site? I can help you figure out, gee, yeah, we poked into something nasty. Here's what we'd recommend for further assessment or maybe some additional resources. Um, and certainly clean up, you know, well, how do we get this asbestos out of this building? How do we clean up this contaminated soil? Um, we can help you identify those assistance programs. Maybe it's something I can help with the DNR. If not, there's some other state programs, maybe even, you know, can send you all the way to national competition with the EPA. Uh, Dubuque has done that a number of times. Um, so the idea is let's just sit down and talk about this. Don't be afraid to call DNR. I don't put my black hat on unless you're burning tight. So, um, so looking a little further here to get into some details. So, what am I going to require of you? Everybody calls the state wants money, um, but it's a two-way street. There's no free lunch. Uh, the program has an intent. It has a purpose. you got to meet its eligibility. So what am I going to ask of you? Well, you should be seeking to do two things, acquire and get that site redeveloped. Um, 
The redevelopment should be one of the following options here. They're listed in the CERCLA Superfund Amendments, but we aren't going to go back to the textbook. This conversation, maybe you just want to be the popular guy. It's that old crappy gas station, and you just want to know is it contaminated or still tanks in the ground. City doesn't want to own it forever, but since Joe Blow just left it sit there, we'll take it in kind of like a foster kid. Uh, my wife's parents took in some foster children, so I kind of use that as a, an example, positive one. But foster kids sometimes need some extra TLC. And so that's what your role might be. You're going to take control of this property so you can figure out what the issues are. You can then leverage these resources that are out there that aren't available to the private sector. But the ultimate goal, number one, is to then flip that. Then eventually, Jack, you'll help get it turned into textile brewing in Dyersville. Um, you're going to create tax base, you're going to create jobs, you're going to create interest with that property, you're going to take it from being an obstacle into an opportunity or kind of the ugly duckling, white swan, whatever you want to call it. But sometimes maybe, well, the city's just going to be the adoptive parent. Yep, we're going to take title, we're going to do it the correct way, uh, but we want to get it cleaned up and we're going to keep it. We're going to build a new library there. We want to build a new EMS center on the site. You know, we want to have our ambulance, our police services and everything in the basement of City Hall. We want to give them their own place. So some cool public use of some value and benefit. Don't come to me and say we want all this environmental help and then we're going to have a parking lot for the road grader. I'm not interested in that. I want to do cool stuff like Hopkinton did. Excuse me. So um, the third thing, sometimes we don't build new big things but we create improved green space, recreational use, or even restore it back to what it was. How many junkyards are in a floodplain? Tons of them. Um, what happens in a floodplain? It floods. But how do we redevelop a floodplain? Well, maybe we turn it into a low impact park. Maybe there's a trail there. Uh, maybe we're doing some wildlife habitat restoration. EPA loves that stuff. Um, so these are the three of the things. Sometimes when you come through the front door, you're just like, I got a crappy old building. I don't know what to do with it. Council doesn't know what to do with it. If we talk, these ideas come out. So you don't have to walk in the door with your complete plan, full circle. Sometimes you might have one, sometimes you don't. Flex Steel still doesn't have one in Dubuque. We can talk about that for a whole day. Um, so sometimes just sitting down, consult with us. We can talk through that. I've seen what other cities have done. Sometimes you might have a council or city leadership that's hesitant. But if you can see, well, so-and-so did it over here, um, then another council might go, oh, really? Well, we're just as good as they are. And then we can get them excited about that. Um, if anybody's familiar in Manchester with the Whitewater Park there, there were like five or six funding sources uh, through DNR and others that were leveraged, but Manchester led the way. But boy, talk about taking that main street and turning that around. That's incredible. And we were a little part of that. Um, so what can we really help with? A little more detail here. <clears throat> you know, BCA has an assessment grant available and handy. If you're thinking about acquiring a property that you want to be developed to help you pay for a phase one, but so will I. This pre-purchase environmental due diligence, look before you leave, we can help do the phase one so we can learn about what we know already about the site and what's around it, like Chris to reference. Um, Kind of like going to your doctor if you say, well, my family's medical history is this, and I kind of feel like that. Uh, that's kind of a phase one, that, you know, kind of the questionnaire you fill out. The phase two is the poking and prodding at the doctor's office. Um, a phase two would confirm or deny if there's contamination present. You've got an old gas station from the 50s that nobody's touched in 40 years. Yeah, you might want to look and see. Um, so we can help do or pay for the phase two. We have grants for asbestos and lead-based paint inspections. If you're going to come in and strip out the inside of a building to remodel it, you know, strip it down to the brick walls and bead blast beams and walls. That's what John Gronin did in the Millwork District. He spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, getting rid of asbestos and lead-based paint on those buildings on Jackson Street downtown. But you would have to do the same thing on a little two-story bar and grill on the bottom, one apartment above, if you wanted to renovate that as a city. You have to look for asbestos in any renovation or demolition. Uh, if you're gonna be stripping off paint from um, bricks and beams, um, you need to make sure that paint you're stripping is not a hazardous waste, so you should have a lead-based paint inspection. I can help pay for those.
at the end of the day, then we do the upfront due diligence. We start kind of laying out, well, what if we take title then? Kind of like a used car. We looked under the hood. We're thinking about buying it, but it's kind of a fixer up. So you eventually got to decide, well, what kind of repairs are we going to need to do to this junker? That's what I look at as an analogy to brownfields. Once we've figured out what maybe the issues are, now if we take title with the proper approach, phase one that's done timely, now you're eligible for post acquisition some cleanup grants from DNR. So hey, we'll Mel. Say, yes, sir. We can't we can't see your slides again. Have you not Online. been seeing them at all or just recently? Well, we've been staring at the, the title slide. Oh, are you, are you still on it? Out of the no. All right, how do we fix this? <clears throat> Took him long enough to tell us. <laughs> well, the way Mel talks, I wasn't one hundred percent sure he was actually changing slides. I, <laughs> around, so I. Do I take that as a compliment? <laughs> How about now? There you go. Yes, yeah, that's weird. I can't tell here what they're saying. Okay, so on the cleanup side. Um, what we can do is if you've taken title properly, if you're voluntarily buying property, if somebody's selling it to you for a buck, giving it to you by quick claim deed, those are called voluntary acquisitions. You know, um, Krista can voluntarily give me a property. She can sell it to me for a buck. She can quick claim deed it to me just saying, I give it to now. Then I have to go record that quick claim deed. Those are all voluntary transactions. You have to do a phase one prior to that to be eligible for federal brownfield grants for cleanup post acquisition. This is the big split in the road. It's a simple signpost, but it confuses everybody. Um, the non-voluntary actions, Krista referenced those, taking sites on uh, tax abatement foreclosure, eminent domain, uh, Iowa's abandonment clause, take somebody to court under chapter 657A and say, they don't mow, they don't clear the sidewalk, the bricks fall down, uh, the doors are pushed in, uh, the 12 year old boys get in there. We've noticed them 10 times and they don't do a darn thing. That's the abandonment proceedings. Those approaches are only things government can do. You know, private people don't have those rights to take property that way. Those are considered involuntary takings according to the EPA. There's a little more latitude there. So they'll say if you take title under those auspices, you don't have to do the phase one. But nonetheless, how you take title is important. So talk to me first. And then once you've taken title, you can be eligible for a 75% reimbursement grant from me, up to 25 grand for eligible environmental cleanup. That's things like asbestos and lead-based paint abatement or removal, contaminated site uh, removal and disposal, maybe even groundwater cleanup, but groundwater is kind of difficult to clean up for 25 grand. Um, and I certainly can't fund a uh, quarter mile plume of environmental solvent, but, Scope and scale in most of our small communities, this money goes a long way. So the site redevelopment process, um, I kind of like to illustrate things graphically. You don't have to memorize this, but most of us read from left to right. So the things in green are what I can do ahead of time. I can help you pay for a phase one. I can do an asbestos inspection ahead of time. A lead-based paint inspection would kick the tires before we buy the car. Um, if necessary, poke and prod for a phase two. Owners have to allow that. Sometimes that gets dicey. But if you decide then you want to acquire it, the stuff in blue is what you do. So site acquisition, you either do your phase one first, or you take another tax foreclosure and then domain abandonment proceedings. Then we can help you with site environmental cleanup cost shares. That's the green part, which I help again. Then redevelopment, you do that. Uh, you've got your capital sources. Maybe you are paying for it out of city funds to build your new city hall. Maybe the private developer now you're giving them tax abatement or you've made it a TIF district or you've got other incentives. But then somebody comes in and does the redevelopment. That's why we help on the front end with all of this environmental boring stuff so we can get you to get that site reused. So we don't have to drive by it every day and look at it. So I want to give you a couple quick examples here of how we pulled all this together and then we can wrap it up for lunch. Um, yes, it's Des Moines, um, but I'm not trying to show big city stuff here. You have buildings of this scope and scale in your communities. This was one of the smaller old depots in Des Moines. Our big grand ones were torn down years ago. 
but this site sat on a list of the 10 most endangered historic properties in Des Moines. A little nonprofit was founded by some little train nerds, some guys that like Lionel and HO model trains. They just decided we needed to save this. So they came to me and said, well, we're a nonprofit. Could you help us with our due diligence before we take title? Could you help us with an asbestos inspection? I said, sure, we can do that. So back in 2015, we started. I put a whopping $12,000 in a phase one asbestos inspection and helping them get rid of some asbestos in a building that had been abandoned for 40 years. That first dollar in, oh, the DNR is helping? The city of Des Moines put in 250,000. Polk County put 150,000 in. They did fundraising, they got another 100 grand. Some philanthropy plus some construction loans, Two million plus dollars. This was a $2.5 million project. Yeah, it's a big one, but it turned into an event center. They restored the old depot. They built this like annex to it, but it started with volunteers, nonprofits, and a vision. And, and lots of things can happen if you want to look at that. Closer to home, this is one of my favorite ones. Monticello, you know, we would take the split there and head up X47 through Sand Springs to Dyersville, or we'd stay on. 151 and take the cut off at Cascade to get to Fargo. So I knew Monticello, and one day Doug Herman, former city manager, called and said, Mel, you got an old factory in town. Every time Kitty Creek and the Maquoketa floods, barrels float out of the window. I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, he says, yeah, there's an old factory, and it's down in the floodplain, da 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 I go, I never knew that was there. Is that kind of like behind Hardy's? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like a block away. I'm like, okay, I got to see this. <laughs> so I go up, and this is what we see. A guy just, you know, collected all of his hazardous waste for years, never got an EPA permit for nothing, never disposed of anything, shut his business down in the early 90s. And we had floods in 98, in 2008, in 2010. And so the barrels would float out of the windows. So this was pretty big. This was beyond 25 grand. But I said, what do you want to do with this place? Well, I don't know if we could get the building down. Uh, gee, like we talked about a green belt, like park thing, maybe. I'm like, aha, one of the three redevelopment options. But this was such a big deal. I could help a little bit with some phase one stuff, asbestos inspection. I had 30 some grand in it, but we had to call it EPA. We're like, somebody violated some real rules here. This is too big for us in brownfields. EPA came in and did what they call a removal action. They spent $400,000. And this was a criminal act. But I said, hey, 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 let's keep it in brownfields. Let's play clean. <laughs> so there's a little old man who's 82 years old who had just, I never heard of any of my mouth. And that was his attitude, but he pled guilty. Rather than go to jail, rather than pay a fine, he agreed to give the property to the city with the phase one first. Um, and he agreed to do 80 hours of community service at the cemetery. And um, we got the property in the city's hand. Um, while they were inventorying all these chemicals for removal, the dam broke at Lake Delhi. What was that, Saturday morning? They had 90 minutes notice. They quickly got everything up on pallets, tried to get everything up they could off the floor so that barrels didn't float out of the window once again, and they got everything up and out of it. Um, so what happened? Some of you may know, we not only have a green belt park, so every time it floods, low impact, pick up a few, you know, tree trunks and limbs. We got an 18 hole disc golf course. They raised money to build this kind of really cool open three-sided kind of Morton building shelter. They have farmer's markets you can pull in and under it. That's so cool. In the winter, they put up little flashboards, six inches of water freezes and they have an ice skating rink. Anybody here from Monticello or on, right? Am I telling the story okay? Yep, you're good. Okay. <laughs> And according to Mr. Herman, um, they raised $450,000. There was some little old lady philanthropist, I think, that stuck yeah. some money in that. Wow. Um, this came out of, we have an old building with barrels floating out of the window. So there was a generic kind of comp plan about some improved green space, little green marks on a map. But all of this had to come from the city council support, community support, leadership by uh, city folks. And this is what you can get out of a crappy brownfield site. And this is a town of 3,800 people. This is not Des Moines. Final one for closure, since Jennifer Morris is on the line with us. One of the first projects I worked with was in Emmitsburg in Northwest Iowa. It's still one of my favorites. Again, old building, some old boy start tearing it down. 
didn't look for remove asbestos, got yelled at by DNR. DNR said, secure the site to prevent further trespass and asbestos release. This is how he secured the site. Really good job. <laughs> and with them sitting there, the county could take it on back taxes. They could do the non-voluntary taking, but they didn't want to inherit a building with asbestos. So they called me, can you help? Well, what's your reuse strategy? Hmm, we didn't really have one at the moment. Um, but we talked, we had a meeting in the courthouse and we talked about, oh, they'd like a parking lot because the BFW meets next door and it's the congregate meal center and it's the voting place. I'm like, I don't fund parking lots. Hmm, darn, what do we do? I just happened to say, where's your like Freedom Rock? Where's your Veterans Monument at the courthouse two blocks away? I like that stuff. Some old county supervisor says, we don't have one of those. We'd like to build a veterans park somewhere. Well, why don't you build it here? It's right next to the voting precinct center where your VFW meets. So they raised thirty thousand dollars by the next week. I helped with eight thousand dollars of asbestos. They built the memorial. They kept adding to it over about ten years. One hundred twenty-five grand was invested. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes you have a restored depot. Sometimes you have a green belt park with a shelter. Sometimes you might just have a monument to your veterans from your community. I'm all for whatever you want to do at your scope and scale and one of those three options. So it's not always a million dollar project. It's just one that's good for you. So that's what I wanted to share with you. You at the end of the day are still going to have the primary investment. If you've ever met Jim Thompson from Iowa Economic Development or his coworkers like Jimmy T in the community uh, department, I've heard them say economic development isn't going to come in and redevelop your town. You are. You're going to invest in it, but we can help you with programs, with assistance. Um, so let me help you with those environmental questions that are getting in the way. But if you get that first dollar going, that gets the confidence going, it gets the partnerships going, and it's a whole lot easier to get that steamroller moving. Um, real quick, I know this is kind of small print, but we have my program at the top. Uh, just Don asked me to talk about some other assistance programs. There's a derelict building grant program that DNR has. I don't manage it. I use it as kind of a cousin resource here, if you will, or double barreling. I can't pay to tear down a building. I can't pay to physically remodel a building. That's not an environmental cost. But the legislature passed a program about 15 years ago to help smaller cities of under 5,000 with grants of up to 50 grand for building demolition or building renovation. Has to be owned by the city though. They're not gonna come in and just help the guy that owns the bar. Um, and if you want to tear it down, if it's that bad of shape, 30% of the waste has to be diverted from your community landfill. You can't just dump it in a ravine. Um, you've got to reuse it or recycle it. Sometimes the bricks or the concrete block can be used for fill outside of a floodplain. Uh, the Iowa Waste Exchange has helped on projects like that. Um, that's where, Sarah, that's where you've got your money, right? Or the, yeah. or the old gas station. Yeah. So we tear it down. And, yeah, and can I just say one thing on that? Just yeah. be careful of when it talks about the diversion. Yeah, and really go in and see what's in your space, mm -hmm. um, because ours was an office or had been like a LP gas or tank place that just walked away from all their paperwork. Yeah. So ours has been thousands and thousands of pounds of paper that we've had to pull out and recycle. So ours is not down yet because of it's taken our time to do. But you can count that as the yeah. So we're, right. we're weighing all of that, but it's yeah. kind of interesting because it has social security numbers on it from, mm -hmm. so we're having to figure out, okay, like this piece of paper has to be shredded, this one, yeah, yeah. bank, yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, there are companies that will come in and just do thread all. Well, now that gets a little more expensive. Exactly. Yeah. My, right. my dime is a little cheaper. Than right. He does for a week. But yeah, there, there are angles to that. Um, it, you know, a lot of buildings weight is, is you know, there's structural components and a lot of our older buildings, it's going to be brick, or maybe concrete block if it was built in the 40s or after. Uh, but that's got to be diverted. But that is just a really great program to help with the physicality of building demo or renovation of the inside to get it kind of like a white box. It's ready to go. If you strip out the old crappy stuff from the 60s that they put in, you get it ready so somebody can come in and frame it out that wants to acquire it. Um, Iowa Economic Development Authority has some stuff too. They have the Community Catalyst Building Remediation Program. Has anybody worked with that? I know we got some folks online too. Yeah. What's nice about that, private entities that own a building can be eligible 
the city has to put in some skin in the game too. But this is a good one for private folks, and it's a private public partnership that way. They can get up to 100 grand. That goes a long way on a, on a main street or a town square. Um, Iowa Economic Development Authority also has the redevelopment tax program for Grayfields and Brownfields. Um, that can be for private folks and nonprofit folks that want to come in, kind of like a foster parent thing, and get a building turned around. Uh, over a decade plus ago, Gronin did that with some buildings on Jackson Street in the Millwork District. Uh, just this year, I think in the last month, Tipton got an award. I don't know, Cedar and whatever. It's like the main corner in town. Um, the Rhinos building. Yeah. The Rhinos building, yeah. So, um, gosh, we've done some others. Uh, Dyersville got some derelict building, I think, towards our textile. And I sit on that review team. I'm one of the five people. So it's an IEDA program, but I work closely with them. Um, that's great. That's a 12% tax credit. So just on a vacant, empty building, if it's sitting there and somebody said, hey, I'm going to spend a you know, million dollars to clean it up uh, or to remodel it, fix it up, they could get 120,000 back. It's competitive though, so you gotta have a good project. Um, if there's a lot of environmental issues to deal with, asbestos, lead based paint, soil cleanup, you get a 24% tax credit. So a million dollar project, you get 240 grand back. Um, we only fund, we, I say with the state review, about 40% of the projects get funded. We had like 55 applicants and we funded somewhere around 23 of them. So the odds are better than in Vegas, but you gotta have a good project. So I'm happy to consult about any of these. Don wanted me to mention the REAP program. Uh, that's BNR's Resource Enhancement and Protection Grant Program. Uh, it's been around since 1985. It's kind of complex. There's about 12 to 15 million dollars available in a given year. There's by law, it's divided up. 15% um, of the funding is available to, uh, to grants for city parks and open space grants. So to, at a municipal level, that's one of the primary things that you could look at. It's competitive. Applications are due usually around state fair time, middle of August. Um, but you can't fund things like um, pools, uh, sports fields, ball diamonds, golf courses. That's not DNR stuff. You have to fund things like, gee, we're going to have a low impact nature trail on this ground that we've acquired, or we do want to expand our city park. Uh, somebody wanted to take down all these trees and build houses. We want to save that. And we like to, you know, maybe put trails in that. Uh, REAP money was used, I think, in Manchester for the uh, Whitewater Park. So REAP is a good program. It's not about cleaning up environmental things, but it's one of those kind of cousin things that sometimes we can tie in. Um, there's a gal in Des Moines that manages that named Michelle Wilson. Uh, she's great to work with. But all you got to do is hop online, type in Iowa DNR REAP. They had just have a great summary page on that. And I know a number of you have worked with REAP either online or, or, or here today. Um, you get, I think you get 90% of the money up front if you're approved, which is nice. And then they hold like a 10% back until you complete it, and then you get the rest. Um, so those are some of the programs that I will I'll always try to sit down. How do we look at this from every angle so that we can help? Sometimes people ask, well, other money is out there. Well, I'm not an expert on every funding source in the universe, but your regional cog is. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes there are things like what? Housing grants, um, your rural electric cooperatives, your local utilities sometimes provide incentives. If somebody's going to build a business or expand one, what are they going to use? Energy, that's what they want. So there's a variety of ways you can continue to leverage this, but just like I had in the slide of little stair step, First dollar in usually gets more and up you go. So that's what I wanted to kind of primarily provide today. Um, you know, if there's any messages here, uh, do your phase one for your flyer property. Call me to consult, call Don to consult. Um, we'll bring in our partners at EPA as well for, you know, if they've got some larger funding. Uh, they also have some like planning and visioning funding through some of their partners. Um, but again, I like to help all 942 cities in Iowa, but I really like to help you guys. So it gives me an excuse to come up here. <clears throat> I came up here on Friday. I spent two days at the toy show. Oh, yeah. Wow. So the back of my vehicle is kind of full of stuff I have to hide from my wife when I come. <laughs> but she she knew what I was going to be doing. <laughs>
<laughs> so we've got a little time here. So between Krista and Donna and myself, again, I know brown fields can be kind of super detailed on one hand, but broad on another. So are there any tough properties, scenarios, strategies, questions that you have seen for any specific properties? Anything we could help with on spitballing? Anybody on the line? Hey, Mel, I got a question. This is Derek from Jones County. Yeah. So my question, and maybe even the EPA can weigh in, is a little more programmatic. Is there ever a point where the government's going to require their own entities to actually clean it up to a pristine level instead of leaving it at the bare minimum, like you know the DOT and stuff does quite often, to make it that makes it harder on cities to redevelop? Gee, Derek, what side are you talking about? <laughs> uh huh. I have a few. Yeah, yeah. So, but D Derek has a good point. Um, most all cleanups um, from the federal government and even the state level are based on what are called risk-based approaches. Um, it can be almost impossible to clean stuff up to naturally occurring levels, which would mean nothing. Um, but there's cleanup to what are called use levels. Uh, we have a residential standard, which means analysis has been done that whatever the contaminant is, let's say lead in soil, you could roll around in it every day, eat two aspirins worth every day. I don't know who would do that. Um, and at that level, it's not going to be anything that's going to cause any problems. So lead, as an example, it's 400 parts per million. You want to eat 400 parts per million of lead every day, go for it. Um, I don't recommend that for children under 12, but as an adult, yeah, great. So that's a risk-based approach. Um, industrial standards, non-residential use properties, the lead standard is two and a half times more liberal. It's 1,100 parts per million. Uh, groundwater, contaminated groundwater is like wrestling smoke. It's almost impossible to fully clean up. So if you're on a city water supply, nobody's going to access that groundwater. It's not a risk. So, but that's the conundrum sometimes. I think Derek is referencing, well, it's like an as-is used car. Yep, it's got a quarter million miles on it. Not as good as new. Gets you around town. But uh, nope, sorry, it, it's not like a new car. Some buyers won't want that. Some want more than what the regular <laughs> okay is. Um, so I don't know, Derek, if you could change legislative minds in both Iowa and DC, possibly. Um, but most cleanups are based a risk-based standard. Now, asbestos is different. If it's there, it has to get it. And that's all there is to it. But I know that can be frustrating sometimes, but we try to give everybody at least what were the decisions? And it's kind of like a used car. What are the precautions or you know restrictions you're still going to need to look at to be able to use that site to any degree? So that's probably not the answer Derek wanted, but that's all I can give on that. <laughs> Anybody else have yeah. any? Yeah, go ahead. From the EPA, since I don't know what site you guys are obviously aware of and are talking about. Um, there, there is, we have what we call the um, redevelopment navigation team where we try to deal with um, navigating redevelopment on hard to um, pin down sites that are uh, where, where decisions about cleanup have made it difficult to get to redevelopment on those sites because of decisions that have been made by other programs that um, it is putting stumbling blocks. So if there are sites like that, that you want to surface to EPA, I may be putting something out there that I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, I'd be happy to maybe take something back or if you want to bring that to us at EPA to the navigation team, we could try and work through some issues. Um, there's a limit to what we can do with federal sites, but for example, we have a federal site where the GSA is responsible for cleaning up the contamination underground, but the above ground, the building part, GSA isn't responsible for cleaning up the asbestos, but that asbestos 
is something that could be dealt with with the brownfields cleanup. So that is eligible for cleanup with the brownfields and is being cleaned up as a brownfields RLF through brownfields RLF. So there may be like pieces and parts of a cleanup that can be dealt with. So I'm, I'm just saying, don't, don't always just assume the answer is no. We love to try and problem solve. So bring it to us at EPA and we'll try and navigate those hard problems. Jennifer, can you just real quick throw your phone number out there? Yeah, sure. Um, um, my phone number is 913-515, or that's my personal cell phone, 5517, <laughs> 5517341. And that's morris.jennifer at epa.gov. Or um, any of us at the Brownfields team is at um, r7 underscore brownfields at epa.gov. That'll go to a group box at the Brownfields team, r7 underscore brownfields at epa.gov. That'll go to the group box. And um, I did not win the Powerball last night, so I'll be here. <laughs> just remember us all if you do jennifer we've gotten along great for years okay <laughs> anybody else have any other scenarios or sites or things that keep you up at night on old properties if you do give us a call either again check with don yes exceptions to the rule chris was talking about it for federal liability even if you didn't own the property at time of damage um it really depends a lot of it is when it was acquired, you know, we've had cities that acquired properties in the 70s or 80s before there were these due diligence requirements of federal law. And again, I, you know, I was teasing her about scaring people straight, you know, say no to drugs. You know, um, yes, we always want you to do a phase one, but again, what's the implication if you didn't? If you're trying to seek um, some of the EPA brownfield grants for cleanup that either EPA has directly, Don may have through a revolving loan, or I have on my mini cleanup grants. Yeah, we are going to ask that. If you took title in the last 10 years and didn't do a phase one, you're going to be SOL. But what we've done before is, well, let's find a different foster parent that you can send that to that would be eligible. We'll help them do the due diligence. So maybe your city or county economic development group or your industrial corporation, we could help them with it. Um, so we just position them. We help them do the phase one. They take title for a while. We help do the environmental cleanup. They can flip it back to you. It's a bait and switch, but EPA said, yeah, you can do that. Um, so do you have a scenario kind of like that? I don't want to get into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was just asking about the line. Yeah, 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 that's fine. I'm always happy to talk theoretical too. Yeah. And, you know, but that's, that's something that we run into. Uh, again, I've had cities, yeah. Well, we just had to take action. I, I mean, the bricks were falling down. So, you know, he was at council that night and signed it over to us with a quick claim deed. I said, did you record it? Yeah. I'm like, oh. So, <clears throat> so yeah. we hope Tipton stopped from doing that. Um, yeah. They about took title to that building in Tipton uh, in the last six months um, because the guy had signed the quick claim deed. But with their good attorney that they now have, Doug Herman, he said, nope, don't, don't file it at the courthouse. I said, as long as you don't file it, Let's do the phase one update. Then the day that's done, you can go down the next day and file right back. So, so yeah. So if you're going back and advising the council, you know, let's let's do our phase ones if we're taking voluntary title of the property. And we could probably help you pay to get that done. Anything else by anybody? Okay. 